Hi. Um, thank you so much for being here. I want to thank the American Psychological Association for the invitation. Um, this is a bit of a personal milestone for me. As, as a graduate student, I was on the executive committee of Division I, the Society for General Psychology, and I had the pleasure of spending time with Bonnie Strickland and Lou Lipset and Michael Wertheimer and Gregory Kimball and George Albee, other seminal psychologists that really kind of um, captured my interest in, in this career. And I guess some testament to Moore's law uh, about computing being exponential. My primary contribution to Division I was setting up a listserv so that members could communicate with each other. And today I get to talk to you about computing that is enabling us to forecast human behavior. So may I just get a quick raise of hands? How many here uh, identify as having an autism spectrum? And how many caregivers of an individual with autism? And how many of you see individuals with autism in your professional practice? OK. So many of you um, will have probably seen the recent CDC Autism and Developmental Disabilities Monitoring Network data that is um, suggesting that autism is occurring <clears throat> one out of every 36 children by age eight. This is a precipitous rise. This represents 2.7% of the general population, or 78 million people worldwide. As some context for the work I want to share with you, in 2021, an international team of leading autism advocates, researchers, nonprofit foundations published in The Lancet a Commission on the Future of Care for Clinical Research in Autism. This is an excerpt of some of their key conclusions or messages that I'd like to read out to you because I think it's an important reminder about where the field is at and where we'd like to see the field go. So of those 78 million individuals with autism, the majority do not receive support from or have access to adequate health care, education, and social care services. Children and adults with autism can have happy and healthy lives, but urgent action is required to promote these outcomes. Autism is heterogeneous and requires personalized evidence-based assessments and interventions accessible and affordable to every person that could improve the lives of individuals and their families. A stepped care and personalized health approach to delivering services and monitoring effectiveness across time provides a framework for efficient and equitable distribution of resources to improve outcomes. And lastly, research that will result in immediate improvements in the lives of people with autism and their families should be prioritized. I'd like to underscore those messages because I think that it's also quite salient for those on the autism spectrum who are non-white, who experience lower social economic status, who have higher support needs, um, who may live in more rural areas. Those factors typically preclude participation in research and then the benefits thereof. As many as two-thirds of individuals with autism engage in aggressive behavior, these are one of the primary reasons why they are referred to behavioral health care services. This tends to manifest as aggression to other people, self-injury, property destruction, and elopement, getting up and fleeing without notice. Families report that aggression increases their stress and isolation, their financial burden, and it decreases available support options because they're afraid to put their child into community settings where they're not certain if that child is going to engage in aggressive behavior, which represents an imminent safety risk for, for them and for others in the environment. At the same time, um, professional support staff report that they have greater injuries, more insurance claims, more turnover, and higher burnout when caring for this segment of the autism population. We don't have enough community supports currently to manage this type of behavior, and so families often find themselves going to emergency rooms or psychiatric inpatient settings for support. But these are very costly. These are acute management areas that were not set up for long-term care. They're not available to most families, and they're uh, exorbitantly expensive. This difficult situation 
collectively can increase morbidity, mortality, and costs, which increases demoralization? Are we going to be able to assist these children, these individuals with autism, in a way that's sustainable in the community? This is particularly impairing and treatment refractory in those with autism who are minimally verbal or non-speaking, about 30 to 40 percent of that population. Their inability to self-report distress that leads to behaviors that seem to occur out of the blue, without warning, creates a very difficult situation for a family member to anticipate um, and to support that individual in a dysregulated state. I want to play a short video for you to give a better description of what I'm describing. Jody is 26 years old. She's diagnosed with profound autism. She is sweet, she is affectionate. She has the purest soul and she has serious episodes of self-injury and aggression. 27% of people who are diagnosed autism spectrum disorder meet the clinical definition of profound autism. It's defined as people who have autism who also have IQ below 50, who are nonverbal or minimally verbal, and who require 24-7 supervision in order to maintain safety. The biggest issue that families of kids with profound autism describe is really the self-injurious and aggressive behavior. There is nothing harder than watching your child hurt him or herself. Children will bang their heads against the floor with such ferocity that they experience detached retinas. They scratch, they bite. Some of these behaviors make it impossible to go out and participate in community activities. So for that reason, a lot of families stay home. They become very socially isolated. Often before these incidents take place, there's no warning to parents. There's no outward sign that you can visibly see that something is going to happen. One incident that really sticks out in my mind is when Jody was five years old and her sister was three years old. I was driving our minivan. Jody wanted to go back home, but we had to stop and do an errand. So when she saw that the car was not proceeding in the route that she knew to be towards home, she managed to unbuckle herself and came at me, started hitting me and punching me and screaming. I sort of pushed her off me. She started going after her sister. It was the most dangerous situation I think I've ever been in in my life with my two children in the car. It's hard for me as a mother when my child is hitting me, but it's, it's, it's worse when she hits my other daughter, especially help, you know, when she's helpless, strapped in a car seat. So that was, that's one I don't really love to think about too much, but that was, that was. That's why the biosensor research that Matthew is doing is critical. If I had some warning that Jody was about to have an aggressive outburst, I could have pulled my car over. I would have tended to her. I would have made sure that we were all safe. If we had that additional tool, I think I would be a little bit more relaxed. I wouldn't feel like I had to know everything about every environment before I took her. Because I would know if the invisible stress were starting, I would be able to intervene. Most of the research that's being done in autism right now is being done on individuals who are able to get themselves to universities to participate. This type of research can be done in their own community. It can be done in their school. It can be done in their home. It's a way to bring the research into the community as opposed to bringing people with autism to the university. These are not bad kids. They're not acting out because they're bad or they're mean. It's part of their autism. What the data from the biosensor allows an adult to do is to intervene compassionately. When someone intervenes, you're helping them to regain their control and be better able to participate in community activities. It really has huge potential to improve the lives of people with profound autism.
So traditionally, uh, aggressive behavior in autism <clears throat> has been conceptualized as escaping or avoiding demands, or oppositional or defiant behavior, or in some instances, forensic behavior, taking pleasure out of causing harm to others. An alternative conceptualization, and one that we're following, is that these behaviors are a maladaptive attempt to express or modulate physiological arousal due to distress. You think of them as fight or flight or homeostatic behaviors. And we have emerging research that suggests that there are several factors associated with emotion dysregulation in autism that can lead to potential aggressive behavior. These include uh, limited emotional language or alexithymia, cognitive rigidity or poor flexibility, lower response inhibition, poor problem solving and abstract reasoning, difficulty reading social and emotional cues in other people, sensitivity to change and environmental stimulation, and biological predisposing factors like physiological arousal, neural circuitry, and genetics. We know that in typical youth, greater ability to regulate physiological arousal is associated with fewer behavior problems. That studies of disorders characterized by emotional and behavioral dysregulation, such as bipolar disorder and antisocial behavior, report a strong association between physiological features, reactivity, and symptomology. We have research in autism demonstrating that an individual may engage in aggressive behavior in an attempt to communicate in the absence of language, or alleviate distress, decrease or increase their arousal to achieve autonomic equilibrium. However, if these behaviors are punished or their underlying features function or are not satisfied, physiological arousal can increase, exacerbating or perpetuating an escalating loop of distress, arousal, and aggression. So this is what's guided our hypotheses and our objectives. Our hypothesis is that physiological arousal precedes aggressive behavior, and our objective is to test whether proximal onset of aggressive behavior can be predicted from preceding physiological signals using wearable biosensors and machine learning. The studies are carried out in the context of real-world psychiatric inpatient hospitals. We are working with the Autism Inpatient Collection, which is supported by the Salmon Simons Foundation for Autism Research Initiative. These are seven psychiatric hospitals. This began in 2013, with the goal to recruit 1,600 individuals with autism who have higher support needs, and share de-identified data, including genetic sequencing, with approved researchers. Inpatients with autism are underrepresented in, mar in modern large data repositories. So this high throughput unique setting enables us to effectively and efficiently collect large amounts of standardized data and improve understanding of this understudied segment of the autism population. Now while data collection in these sites primarily focuses on phenotypic and genetic data, the inpatient setting is also a nice platform to identify mechanisms underlying emotional and behavioral symptoms to, to inform intervention. And we thought it was a unique ability to study aggressive behaviors in situ due to the safety of the inpatient environment and control over environmental factors. So the data I'm going to share with you today are 70 individuals with autism in the inpatient setting from four primary sites of the AIC, Spring Harbor Hospital in Portland, Maine, Bradley Hospital in Providence, Rhode Island, Western Psychiatric Institute in Pittsburgh, and Cincinnati Children's Hospital. You'll see the demographics below. We are seeing individuals that are between nine and 15 years of age. They're predominantly male, white, non-Hispanic. Over 50% are minimally or non-speaking. The majority are moderately to significantly below IQ average. And length of hospital stays tend to be anywhere from 40 to 80 days. So within these settings, we are asking the youth with autism to wear the E4 by Empatica, which is a wearable biosensor that is shockproof and waterproof, and wirelessly is able to record 
local to the device or stream to a receiving unit, blood volume pulse, interbeat interval, using photoplasmography or optics, where we can derive heart rate and heart rate variability. It's measuring three axis acceleration. This is what's in your phone that lets you go from landscape to um, horizontal mode. This is also what is in a Fitbit that enables step counting. We get body surface temperature through thermopile and then electrodermal activity or sometimes referred to as galvanic skin response, which is a measure of sympathetic nervous system arousal through sweating. All of which is being recorded um, at a fixed sampling rate with a um, system clock. While the inpatients are wearing the sensor, we have asked inpatient unit staff to annotate the onset and offset of aggression to others, self-injurious behavior, and emotion dysregulation, which you could also refer to as tantrums or meltdowns, provided with operational definitions. And whenever they see opportunistically one of these behaviors occurring, they annotate the onset and then the offset of that behavior. And the clock in that mobile phone application is synchronized with the clock in the biosensor. For the 70 individuals in the present study, we had 429 data collection sessions, averaging between four and five hours per observation period, or 500 total hours of data collection. And within that period, we see 619 aggression events, 2,063 tantrum or meltdown events, and 3,983 instances of self-injurious behavior for a combined total of 6,665 aggressive behaviors with concurrent biosensor data that's available for machine learning. Now before I walk through this somewhat complicated slide, previous results that we had obtained prior to this study is with 20 inpatients from one of the AIC sites, and we were looking specifically at aggression towards other people and demonstrated with ridge regularized logistic regression that we could predict the onset of an aggression one minute before it occurred. And we were looking at both population models, train on everybody's data, leave one person out, shuffle through until you've got everybody represented, and person dependent models where everybody is being trained and tested with, within their selves over time. And we were about 80% accurate at that one minute mark. The current results extend those findings, and I would say enhance those findings, in that we are now looking at three different discrete behaviors, aggression to other, self-injury, and tantrums and meltdowns. And <clears throat> we have extended our ability to make predictions further out in time. We're now up to three minutes of advance notice, and we use different models, I'll walk through that briefly, but on average, we're still maintaining at 80% accuracy for each behavior and in combination three minutes in advance with a population model. This, uh, as I'll allude to a little later, the population models enable us to do more rapid dis um, training of the classifier because we can start with a pre-populated model than having to wait to, to train over time within an individual. So what you see in the top left-hand corner, um, we're using neural networks logistic regression, and support vector machines. This is the area under the curve, or this might be a way that we plot sensitivity and specificity. That dashed blue line up the middle, that would be 50% or chance agreement. And you'll see that all, that all of our classifiers are performing well above chance. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, support vector machines are at 85% accuracy, three minutes out. Logistic regression, 80%, and neural network, 78%. So if we take this again on, on ensemble or on average, we're 80%. What you see on the bottom left, using accelerometry, the motion sensor, as a proxy for the intensity of the behavior, um, you'll see that we have essentially a, a kind of dose response in terms of accuracy. So the less intense behaviors were making correct predictions about 70% of the time, the moderate intensity 
74% of the time, and the high intensity, 80% of the time. What you see on the top right uh, is demonstrating that the support vector machines have a tendency to overfit the data, and so the logistic regression in the neural network seem to perform better uh, in a generalized fashion, and that each of the target behaviors, the emotion dysregulation, self-injurious behavior, and aggression are performing at 70 to 80%. If we combine all together, we do a little bit better as a single class than discrete classes. But we are detecting discrete classes comparable to the total uh, combination. And then on the bottom right, this is where we have repeated measures within the same individuals. And so we test with early sessions, or sorry, train on early sessions, test on late sessions. This would be our indication of test retest reliability or st stability of the classifiers. And those are staying, maintaining at about 80% accuracy over time. So future directions for this work, we sort of got two parallel tracks. One is using more advanced analytics like transfer learning and do domain adaptation to see if we can create individualized models without all that labeled data. Think of Alexa or Siri or Google Assistant. Right out of the box, it can understand what you're saying. We don't need dragon dictation anymore to train it. Irrespective of your age, of your sex, of um, accent, it, it understands you. We're seeking the same thing um, with our models for individualization from the population model. You won't need so much data to get the benefit the first time you use it. We're also looking at hierarchical Markov modulated and non-homogeneous point process models to account for non-stationarity in the signals and the feature statistics. That's a complicated way of saying that there might be differences in physiological features that precede the behavior across a relatively heterogeneous population. So identifying different subtypes of preceding physiology may be a more effective way to have higher prediction accuracy in a diverse population. And then through collaboration with the Marcus Autism Center and their severe uh, behavior unit at Emory University, we're now deploying our sensors and our machine learning classifiers in the context of functional analysis of behavior and looking to see if their determination of these behaviors as socially mediated or automatically maintained um, gives us better prediction accuracy, but also helps open up the possibility of more personalized intervention. At the same time that we're doing that um, analytical work, we've developed a prototype that enables us to run our classifiers in real time. So the biosensor is streaming to a phone where somebody is doing the annotation. Both sources of data are being pushed to the cloud. Our classifiers are running, and then uh, real time alerts are being sent back down to the phone. The idea will be that if one can receive early notification, now this is three minutes, this is enough time to do something. Someone can stop what they're doing, triage their attention, make sure that everybody else in the environment is safe, and then try to engage in de-escalation or motion regulation strategies with the goal of trying to prevent these behaviors from happening in the first place. Instead of reactive responding, we can do proactive responding. There's probably a great variety of different triggers and different efficacious interventions. And so as more and more people use the system, we would like to start to learn maybe some policy oriented. Given your child's behavior, this setting, this amount of time, these are the types of interventions that you might deploy. I've gone a little long, so I have to skip that last one, but I think I just articulated what that animation was intended to show you. I do want to thank um, my collaborators, faculty, staff, students, uh, postdocs at Northeastern University, our clinical collaborators at the Marcus Autism Center, uh, the Nancy Larry Marks Family Foundation, the Simons Foundation, the National Institute on Deafness and Other Communication Disorders, the National Cancer Institute, National Library of Medicine, National Science Foundation, and the Department of Defense. And if anybody likes what I've been saying and would like to learn more about computing and public health coming together, we created a PhD program <clears throat> at Northeastern University, joint between the Curie College of Computer Science and the Bouvet College of Health Science and in personal health informatics, and we would love to change public health in a positive way using computing. Thank you very much. Please welcome to the stage Dr. Rick Doblin. Hey. 
Thank you. Um, I'd like to start by thanking the organizers of this conference. It's so great to be at a conference that I'm not organizing because I can actually enjoy more of it. We just had the Psychedelic Science uh, 2023 conference in Denver. It was the world's largest uh, conference on psychedelics ever, and we had uh, 12,400 people. So psychedelics have emerged from the underground and are starting to be um, really widespread use in, in uh, research and then hopefully um, in psychiatric practice and psychotherapeutic practice as well. And I think the critical thing that we're going to be really needing for proper scaling is going to be uh, trained therapists. And so that's uh, why I'm so glad to be speaking here um, to sort of tell the story so that you can see that um, there's a good chance that this is coming and if you're interested in um, learning about practicing MDMA-assisted therapy, we do have um, educational programs <laughs> that um, you can find out on our website. Um, so uh, I started MAPS in 86. This is 37 and a half years now of psychedelic science. Um, things have changed a lot since uh, I began this in 86. It was really um, 72, 51 years ago where I um, decided to focus my life on psychedelics and as you heard in the intro, my real goal is to become a legal psychedelic uh, psychotherapist. Um, this is um, one of my favorite images. You'll see this is um, the interpretation of the MAPS logo by the psychedelic artist Alex Gray. And the, the key point of this logo is really that it's the human hands are uh, in the foreground and the sort of psychedelic imagery is in the background. And so what that really means is what we're doing is not psychedelic therapy, it's therapy facilitated by psychedelics. We will never have um, MDMA as a take home medicine for people to do on their own without supervision of therapists. Unlike ketamine or spravato, sometimes where you can take it home, MDMA therapy is never meant to be uh, delivered in that way. Um, where we're at after 37 and a half years is that we have two successful phase three studies that are completed. Um, the first one we've published already the results in Nature Medicine. The second one is under review right now and we hope to have it available um, in a peer reviewed journal in a couple months. And so we are now gathering the data to submit to FDA for what's called the NDA, the new drug application, and we're anticipating uh, potential FDA approval in the, the middle of next year. And in order, why I say um, we're hopeful is that before we entered phase three, um, what we did is we did an eight month process called the special protocol assessment, where you negotiate with FDA every aspect of the phase three designs, all the other information that you want, that the FDA may want to see, and you try to come to an agreement. And we did get an agreement letter and the special protocol assessment. And what that means is that the FDA has agreed with us on the protocol design. And one of the biggest challenges with doing research with psychedelics is how do you do an effective double blind? Um, and the quick answer is there's no way. <laughs> uh, so that's why we had to really come to agreement with the FDA on how we would do this. And from a scientific point of view, what the FDA indicated to us is that there's um, two main ways to deal with experimental bias when you um, don't have a successful double blind. The first one is just random assignment. That's sort of the basic of all different clinical research that you have everybody similarly motivated. They're all willing to go through either the placebo control condition or the experimental condition. And then the other part is at the end is that the, neither the therapist nor the patients are the ones that evaluate the progress. You have to have independent raters that are blind to the condition of what people received. And if you have random assignment and independent raters, and we do have um, mostly psychologists doing the clinician-administered PTSD scale, the CAPS, um, by Zoom in a random assignment to whoever it is is next that needs it. So that in, in almost all cases, the patients are only um, evaluated once by each uh, independent rater. We have a pool of over 20 independent raters to do that. So th that's where we're at right now. Uh, 
Um, briefly, MDMA was invented by Merck in 1912. Um, they were not looking, their stories that it was made as an appetite suppressant and something like that, all that's false. They just were trying to get to a hypertensive drug and they ended up um, patenting everything along the way. And as far as we know, there's no human use of it um, by Merck at all. And it's in the public domain. And then Sasha Shulgin, whose picture is here, um, was uh, inspired by his first experience with mescaline in the 60s. And, and he uh, was working for Dow. He developed the first uh, biodegradable insecticide. And Dow told him he could work on whatever he wanted to do. And so he uh, said, all right, great. You're going to set me up with a lab to study and create new psychedelics. And it didn't take a few years before Dow said, no, that's not what we want you to do. <laughs> Go away. So he created his own lab at his house. He taught at UC Berkeley and elsewhere. And anyway, he's the one that we consider like the godfather of uh, MDMA. And he, um, in a noble condition of scientists, he experimented on himself first. And then uh, if that worked, he would share it with his wife. And then they would have a small group of 12 people that they would give it to, and they would all get impressions on these different drugs. And if they thought it had value, then they would um, give it to this fellow, Leo Zeff. And we call him the secret chief. Leo was the leader of the underground psychedelic therapy movement. He was about to retire. And uh, Sasha was like, um, well, you might want to try this new drug. <laughs> and after that, he said, I'm not going to retire. <laughs> so um, he trained uh, hundreds of psychiatrists and psychotherapists. And there was an estimated um, half a million doses of MDMA used in these quiet therapeutic settings from the middle of the 70s into the early 80s. But MDMA leaked out of that and then uh, became ecstasy, um, particularly at this place in Dallas that uh, one of our presidents uh, went to a bunch when he was younger, <laughs> George Bush, as you might guess. Um, he said one of the greatest things, actually, George Bush. He was. Um, uh, asked about his cocaine use, and he said, when I was young and irresponsible, I was young and irresponsible. <laughs> um, but he also went and danced at the Star Club, and this is where ecstasy came to the attention of the police, and they had no knowledge of the therapeutic use. They just knew about the recreational use. So in 84, the DEA moved to criminalize MDMA. Um, that's uh, me in the picture. You can see in the background. Um, taking a picture right before I walked into DEA headquarters and um, filed for a hearing. And this was to try to defend the therapeutic use of MDMA. Um, we won the case, but the, D the DEA rejected the recommendation, kept it illegal. We won two times in the appeals court. Eventually, we lost. And so in 86 is when I started MAPS. And the idea was that this is what we need, really, to go through the FDA, that we're going to need science, we're going to need uh, therapists, we're going to need to do the research, and that there's no way to force the DEA. And at the time, this was during Nancy Reagan and Ronald Reagan, just say no, um, there was really um, no political way. It had to be through science, through the FDA. So um, this was uh, Timothy Leary at uh, the first big conference for MAPS in 1990. Um, after Tim's talk was over, I went up to him and I said, um, you know, what advice do you have for us, for those of us that want to work with the government to make uh, MDMA and other psychedelics into medicines? And his immediate comment was, fuck the government. <laughs> he said, I am so far past um, asking for permission for anything, but I'm glad you're doing it. And so this is sort of the passing of the torch from the 60s, leaving Harvard, leaving science, and sort of moving into culture. And now we're trying to move it back into science as another way around to get back into culture. Our first study was with uh, Charlie Grobe. That, so it took um, uh, six years before we got permission. Over five protocols were rejected. Charlie, by the way, is um, I just emailed him yesterday. He's proposing to do a study with 16 and 17-year-olds with PTSD. So we are being uh, trying to move into um, adolescent populations. Um, and the FDA is requiring us to do that after FDA approval. Um, and nobody would approve the study, even though we had, uh, when we started to try to do PTSD patients, we had FDA approval, but it took us um, about three years to get the IRB approval. And I was so frustrated, we went through seven IRBs, um, I realized, hey, MAPS can start our own IRB. We're an institution. 
So we had everything ready to start our own IRB, and I thought, well, you know, it's better if you can have some outside group authorize you than do it yourself. So I noticed that there was one IRB whose name was Copernicus Group, and I figured if any IRB was sympathetic to science and religion being, you know, I mean science being blocked by religion and politics, it would be Copernicus. And they lived up to their name, and they finally approved us. And then it took us another uh, 12 years, basically, to do all of the phase two studies. And November 29th, 2016, we had the end of phase two meeting. And after that is when we did this uh, special protocol assessment process to figure out how to do phase three. And so it was really 2018 we started our first phase three study. So MDMA releases serotonin, uh, norepinephrine, dopamine, a bunch of hormones, uh, principally oxytocin. Um, if you have PTSD, it changes your brain. Um, you have a hyperactive amygdala. You have um, reduced activity in your prefrontal cortex. You don't think as logically as much. And hippocampus activity is lower. So you're not able to really process um, traumatic experiences and put them in the past. It always feels like it's about happening. It's going to happen again. And MDMA does pretty much the opposite. It reduces activity in the amygdala so that it reduces the fear response to these perceived emotional threats. Um, it increases activity in the prefrontal cortex so that you can think more logically. It triggers things that would be automatically triggering. You have a bit more time to sort out. Is it happening now? Is, it, is that noise really a gun? Is that something else? And then MDMA increases connectivity with uh, amygdala and hippocampus so that you're able to more effectively take an emotional memory experience it with the fear reduced, and then in memory um, reconsolidation and neuroplasticity, um, you're able to reroute how this memory is brought back in the future. And so when it's brought back in the future, the memory is it's in the past. It's not happening right now. So this is what MDMA does. There was an um, incredible study that was done by uh, Gould Dolan at Hopkins with octopuses. So if you've seen the movie um, or the documentary, My Octopus Teacher, which is really great, you know that octopuses are solitary until the end of their life when they uh, are mating season. And so Gould wondered, what happens if you give MDMA to an octopus? And it turns out they do still process serotonin. And when you give MDMA to an octopus, you soak the MDMA, you, you put the octopus in water in which has a bunch of MDMA in it, they absorb the MDMA. And lo and behold, all of a sudden, they want to hang out with other octopuses. <laughs> so this is uh, evolutionary conserve, pre-verbal. And this is one of the reasons why I think, from the previous talk that we just heard, I think that MDMA can be helpful for autism, for um, children in different ways who don't necessarily have the ability to verbalize. So it's a bit of a leap from octopuses to humans. But I think that that's um, a logical leap that we have done a study with uh, autistic adults with social anxiety with MDMA, and it worked pretty well. The other interesting thing that Gould has also done is given a bunch of MDMA to mice. And what she showed is that it opens up this critical period for social reward learning, and that it's dependent on oxytocin. And it's not in the title of the paper, but what the paper also says is that this oxytocin release um, is then followed by uh, uh, synaptogenesis, meaning that there are a whole bunch of new synapses, new neural connections that are created um, after the uh, administration of MDMA, even in mice. And so we think, how is it that you could have one or two or three psychedelic experiences and have lasting effects? And the answer, I think, is because you are fundamentally changing the, the wiring of the brain. Um, for those of you who have uh, been aware of the work that was done in the 60s with LSD and the recent work with psilocybin over the last 20 years, there's a correlation between the depth of the mystical experience and therapeutic outcomes. So this is a different aspect of mechanism of action. We use the same questionnaire, the mystical experience questionnaire, with MDMA in our PTSD studies in phase two. And what we demonstrated is that there is no connection, there is no correlation between mystical experiences and people getting better uh, with reduced symptoms of PTSD. Uh, and I think that that's um, not that surprising when you think about it. It's taking traumatic experiences that people have had, bringing them up, ego intact, remembering the experiences, trying to work through them, and then 
restructure your brain how you remember them in the future. So there's no need for us in our therapeutic approach to sort of guide people to a mystical experience. Some people do have it. Quite a few people actually do have these, quote, mystical experiences that can be good for other things, but it's not linked to uh, reductions in PTSD. So the therapy is different than normal therapies <clears throat> in that we call it inner-directed therapy. And what it means is that we're basically helping people to heal themselves, that we don't use the word guide, that they're their own guide. People are their own guide. Once you give MDMA, it's like dreaming at night. There's a barrier between the, um, a membrane, you could say, between the conscious and the unconscious mind. And things emerge in your dreams. There's something similar with MDMA, with LSD, with other psychedelics, is that there's a rise into awareness of either previously suppressed emotions or different things that people haven't thought about. And there's a logic to it, an internal emotional logic. And we support that. So we're not leading people to their trauma or whatever, we're just supporting whatever is emerging, either in their experience, their memory, their physical body, pains, all different ways. So this alliance between the therapist and the participants, and we know therapy alliance is the key factor for um, outcome, good outcomes in therapy. And then the direction of the session is sourced from the patient's experience. So we don't use guided imagery, although that can be effective. And that this inner directed approach really is based on this idea of this inner healer. This, we all know that our bodies do that, below our level of conscious awareness. And so the, the hypothesis is there's something similar um, with psychedelics. We have a manualized therapeutic method. It's now in about the eighth version of it. We've been um, modifying it all time. We also have adherence criteria. It's, we're in the fifth version of that. So it's a very um, standardized therapy, which is what we needed in order to do the research. Um, and our education program is now um, taking applications for people that want to go through our, our program. Um, and it's basically 55 hour immersion course with uh, mostly watching videotapes of therapy sessions, but also discussing what is the uh, treatment method and also um, some kind of role plays, things like that. Uh, so what are our results? Um, we published in Nature Medicine in 2021. Um, this is the therapy, and again, what I want to say is that we have done this with the goal of optimizing therapeutic outcomes. This has not been done with what's the minimally effective product that we can bring to market, you know, as you often hear about in tech. Also, we've not looked at this, what is the cheapest intervention that we can get? So this is a two-person team. One person has to be licensed as a therapist. The other person does not need a license, but they work together. We often use male-female team, and there's 42 hours of therapy. There's 12 90-minute non-drug psychotherapy sessions, three for preparation and then nine for integration after each MDMA session. And then there's three MDMA sessions, um, which are about a month apart. And the comparison is therapy with inactive placebo. So it's therapy with MDMA versus therapy with inactive placebo. We start the first section with 80 milligrams. And after two hours, if people want, they can get a supplemental dose of half the initial amount to extend the, the plateau. And then they have the option of staying with that dose or going up to 120 uh, milligrams for the second one, followed by 60 milligrams. And then the third is also an option. And about 90% of the people go up higher to the 120 and the 60, and about 90% of the people take the supplemental dose. And so this is then our approach. Some people do uh, report that one feels enough to them, or two feels enough to them. But um, a lot of people, we feel, um, make a lot of progress also with the third. So this, this is the standard model. Some people may need four. Some people may be fine with one or two. But this, this and then we do a two-month follow-up. And that's because we want to get past what's called the psychedelic afterglow. We, we don't want people to say, oh, you know, this is a temporary thing. You, you tested them the week after MDMA, and now everything's great. And so it's a two-month follow-up. But we also do a much longer follow-up, which is going to be more for insurance companies, because this is a labor-intensive, therapeutic-heavy intervention. And what we need to show is that it's, um, it's durable. And if it's durable, the results that we get, insurance companies will pay for it. Um, so our results are pretty great. Um, 
the placebo group, meaning the, the control group, therapy without MDMA, at the two-month follow-up, 32% of these people that had PTSD, an average of over 14 years, one-third over 20 years, almost all of them treatment-resistant, have tried other things. The hardest cases, these are severe PTSD patients, about one-third of them no longer qualify for a diagnosis of PTSD. But when you add MDMA, all of a sudden now it's 67%, twice as good. And another 21% have clinically significant reductions of PTSD symptoms, meaning that um, they still have PTSD, but that they're on the road to uh, improving their lives. And we've done a longer term follow-up, which suggests the results are, are durable. Um, so uh, at least six months, some cases a year or more. Um, the safety data, which is very important to share whenever we're sharing the efficacy data. Um, so you can see that these are the acute, uh, transient, non-serious um, side effects, most of the muscle tightness, decreased appetite, nausea, all of these are more prevalent in the MDMA group than in the placebo group, but none of them are serious and they all fade away. Um, other aspects of safety, um, on the right, these adverse events of special interest, suicidality, cardiovascular problems, abuse potential, actually they're all more in the placebo group or the same as in the MDMA group. And the serious adverse events, we had one woman try to kill herself twice during the study, and another woman had such severe suicidal ideation that she uh, checked herself into a hospital not to uh, self-harm, and both of those were in the placebo group. So we feel that we've got a really good safety record. Science, at the end of the year, said that this was one of the top 10 scientific breakthroughs of the world in that year. Um, I think it's great about our study, but really what I think they were doing is that this is about the whole field. Psilocybin is moving forward, ketamine is moving forward, so they gave our study, which is the only completed phase three study ever with psychedelics, but it was really a, a reward to the whole thing. And we've just announced, uh, well, not just, in January we announced that our second phase three study is, really was confirmatory. Um, and then this was a tremendous thing because the American Medical Association, we partnered with Compass Pathways and they um, developed a new billing code because psychedelic therapy doesn't happen within a 50 minute hour and often you know, our MDMA sessions are eight hours long. So how do you bill for it if you're a, psych a therapist? So now the AMA has come out with the new billing code. Um, and we want to train 25,000 therapists by uh, 2030, and we want to treat around 1.5 million uh, PTSD patients by 2032, which is really not very good because there's 13 million PTSD patients. So in the next um, basically nine years, we're hoping to treat only 10% of uh, the PTSD patients, and that depends on the number of therapists that we're really able to train. So, so I guess that's my main message to you, to think about our educational programs that we can have a great treatment, but it's not just the MDMA, it's only delivered by therapists. Um, and so um, right now the question is, what kind of requirements might FDA have for this? And we had a formal dispute with FDA. They tried to impose, on phase three we don't have, uh, they, they can't change it because of special protocol assessment agreement unless there's safety reasons, but we had, um, the FDA for a protocol to give MDMA to therapists as part of their training. They said they'll never approve it. We already had one. They said they'll never approve the second one. Plus the lead person needs to be MD PhD and you need a doctor on site. And this is poison pill for the whole industry. You do not need to afford a doctor. You can't afford a doctor on site or MD PhD. It's a complete delusion that MD PhDs are better than regular therapists. And so we filed a formal dispute. We spent over a quarter million dollars and we won on every single point. So physicians don't need to be on site, just on call. They need to do the screenings. Um, the lead person can be licensed to do therapy. Second person doesn't need a license. So very briefly, I'm, I've just got a minute or two, but I'm gonna share that we have our method, but that we are exploring different ways that MDMA can be used. So there's a therapy called cognitive behavioral conjoint therapy. And it's where um, dyads, the conjoint means dyads. It's where one member has PTSD, but it affects the relationship, and you bring both people into the therapy, and we've done that where both of them get MDMA in small pilot studies. Candace Monson is the one that developed cognitive behavioral conjoint therapy at the Boston VA when she was there, and the results were outstanding in this particular study. We're doing longer ones. Now we're 
combining MDMA with cognitive processing therapy, which is one of the main therapies, and also we're trying to combine it with prolonged exposure. So the idea here is that psychedelics are tools and they can be used in many different ways. And we may think that we have developed the most optimized uh, treatment manual, but maybe we haven't. And so we wanna show other people that have expertise in treating PTSD that MDMA can potentially be used in combination with prolonged exposure and um, other forms of therapy. So we're doing that. We've done this study with uh, MDMA assisted therapy for social anxiety adults on the autism spectrum. The results were really promising there. Uh, we've worked with uh, people at end of life with life-threatening illnesses. Ben Sessa did a study in England with people with alcohol use disorder, not surprisingly. Uh, most of them are running away from trauma. If you help them deal with the trauma, then they don't need to uh, cover up their pain with uh, alcohol. Um, this is a great study, by the way, right nearby here in Rockville, Maryland, uh, uh, Sunstone. And this is, again, um, is, the loca is the patient the one person or is it more the family? So this is uh, cancer patients with uh, adjustment disorder. And again, the cancer patient and their partner both get MDMA and the results were great. And inside the VA, we're doing this um, uh, at Loma Linda VA, uh, October 12, 2021, uh, was the first MDMA administration to a vet with PTSD inside the VA. I'd been struggling for 26 years to fund stuff inside the VA. Rachel Yehuda is uh, doing stuff at the Bronx VA, which is tremendous. She's also done work with epigenetics of um, multi-generational trauma. Uh, the secretary of the VA and the um, Undersecretary of the VA just visited her the other day. Um, we're starting group therapy study in Portland, Oregon, and then um, this is going to be a direct comparison of MDMA versus CPT at the Palo Alto VA. This is um, going to be using an active uh, control, uh, D-amphetamine. Um, I don't think it's um, going to fool anybody, um, but more importantly, um, in the work that we did, I thought that the best way to do a double-blind study is with full-dose MDMA with therapy versus low-dose MDMA with therapy. And the goal was to find the dose of MDMA that was high enough to cause confusion, but not so high that you would get so much therapeutic benefits that you wouldn't be able to see a difference between the two groups. It turned out that low-dose MDMA made people uncomfortable. And it's like getting off in an airplane, turbulence at the beginning. Um, and then the, the transition between where they're uncomfortable and where the MDMA starts working is really narrow. So it, I think that this, when you compare it with D-amphetamine, I think the D-amphetamine may indeed make uh, the therapy worse, that, that the people with um, therapy would do better, at least that's what we saw. People that got therapy with inactive placebo did better than the people that got therapy with low-dose MDMA. And then this is where we're gonna be trying San Diego and Phoenix VA uh, cognitive behavioral conjoint therapy. Um, and the psychedelic clinics of the future will look like this, meaning that people will be cross-trained with ketamine, MDMA, psilocybin, 5-MAO-DMT, and you end up uh, having therapists customize a treatment program for each individual patient. We are, gonna, we are being required by the FDA to do a pediatric study if we get approved in adults. And one day we need to do a um, dose-response safety study with uh, therapy with uh, PTSD patients on SSRIs. A lot of people on SSRIs don't want to taper. One of the advantages of ketamine is that you don't have to taper people off of their medicines. Okay, um, and then we're going towards, this is our new goal, uh, world of net zero trauma by 2070, meaning globalized therapeutic approach to all sorts of people. We'll develop our own measure of gross national trauma. There's gross national happiness by Bhutan and all these others, so we'll develop this metric, and then we'll prioritize global communities. and. I would like to just say again that, that why I'm so glad to be here and to speak to you is what we really need the most is to have this um, therapy be um, adopted by more therapists. So we'd like to, again, encourage you to consider um, going through our training program. So thank, thank you very much.